Thanks for that introduction. Um, so my talk, I've essentially broken into three sections to provide a little bit about my insights into developing within open source platforms. Um, and just to give you guys a sense of my career trajectory, uh, I did my PhD in the States at Rutgers University. And that's when I first started doing ITK and UCK. And then I moved over to UCL uh, and I spent a lot of time developing open source platforms there. And now I'm a lecturer and I'm continuing to use open source. So I've really seen it at all levels of my career. Um, but my talk is essentially broken into three bits. So I'm gonna very briefly talk about some of my projects that I've worked on recently. Um, then I'm gonna start talking about what I think are some of the key considerations to think about when you're thinking about using open source software um, for medical purposes. And finally, I'm gonna talk about what I think are some of the big open challenges that I still don't know how to solve. And hopefully some of you guys will have ideas. Um, so, the main platform I've been working on for quite a while is uh, EpiNav, which was built on top of the MITK architecture, uh, which is out of the German Cancer Research Institute. Um, and it's really a standalone library built on top of MITK with some plugins specifically to allow us to do the manipulations we want. Um, and also, just as a bit of background, um, this was originally started in 2013 at UCL, and it was part of what we called at the time the NIMTK platform. So this was a set of three projects all based out of UCL, all using a common library. Since then, uh, we moved on to Kings, we sort of spun out from those other projects. Um, but we sort of had our mini, mini consortium. Um, and the key thing about EpiNav is it's a surgical planning software to plan stereotactic nerve surgeries. Um, so it allows clinicians to essentially interact with brain imaging, place, identify regions of interest that they want to place trajectories in, and then assess those trajectories. Um, and as part of this work, one of the things we had to do was we had to support interfacing with commercial neural navigation systems. So we have an export module, so you can essentially take what's built in this sort of open source software and actually put it into a commercial system. Um, that involved identifying a commercial partner, um, which in our case was Medtronic, signing some DAs with them to get access to how their system worked a little bit and working with them to make sure we had that strong interface. Um, and since 2018, the software has been used in a prospective clinical trial at the National Hospital for uh, Neurosurgery and Neuroscience to, and also uh, UMC Utrecht to plan SEG implantations. Um, and this is what I would say is my not so open source contribution because a lot of the key algorithmic <laughs> components we've chosen to hold back in case closed source because the whole idea is at the end, we want to be able to commercialize this. Um, so because the end goal is commercialization, a lot of the key algorithms are closed source. Uh, we still try and be good members of the open source community and contribute back to the MITK platform when we have bug fixes or issues that are more general. Um, but this is sort of one way of approaching things which is essentially holding back some of the things you're working on while being a good contributor. Um, yeah, and this is just a little video showing you, you know, some of the interactions you can do. So you can look at some risk maps related to the trajectory placement and scroll along and see where you're going through the anatomy um, as well as doing some more advanced planning. So then we've had a couple of other shorter projects that are also open source. Um, so one of my students created a, a Python package called Torch.io, which is really just about being able to load in imaging data for deep learning and do some data augmentation. So this is just a little gift showing you, you know, you can do rotations, you can degrade the images, et cetera. Um, and it, like I said, it really started as a single person project. I think now, it has about 34 contributors. Um, so many people are using it. And it was really created because there was a lack of tools that allowed you to very quickly and easily create data augmentation strategies prior to doing some sort of architecture. Um, and throughout my talk, I'm gonna make distinctions here. So this is what I would call a research tool for researchers. So there's many different way, reasons you might wanna do open source. Well, EpiNav is really built for clinicians to be an end user. This is a tool that's built to help researchers so you don't have to, you know, 
redo an equine transformation every time you want to load some data into a network. Um, the other project we had that's a shorter project is really a research tool for clinicians. So it's very, very niche. It's called the Semiology Visualization Toolkit. And what this allows you to do is essentially query and visualize a database of epilepsy uh, semiology associations. So semiology and epilepsy is when you have a seizure, you have certain clinical symptoms. These can help tell the clinician which parts of the brain are affected. And essentially what we do is we have a little database so you can take off the symptoms that the clinician uh, sees with the patient. And then all we do is use a little MNI brain to highlight which parts of the brain in the database that we have, which has about 500 papers in it of where other people have reported those same symptoms arising. So you can see where it's happening. Um, in this case, we you know, use Slicer as a plugin. And it was really just to allow clinicians to visualize and sort of understand what the literature says about clinical symptoms. Um, and I like to say this is the research tool for clinicians. So hopefully the user interface is pretty easy. We don't expect the clinicians, they notice a bug to actually like, you know, go in and try and like alter anything, right? Um, so it's really just about being able to visualize and explore data. So it's quite a simple and, and well-contained project. Um, and the other thing I want to say uh, is I encourage everyone on my team to open source their code, both for methods and experiments, to make data uh, reproducible. But in my mind, open source for scientific reproducibility is not the same thing as creating an open source platform. So even though there's lots of repositories on my team that get released to you know, essentially be able to reproduce their results uh, in their papers, that's not actually a platform. So, and I think most of us can agree if you're a developer, right? You can go on GitHub, there's tons of projects out there that maybe have a handful of commits and then get abandoned. Oftentimes it's because it's more for reproducibility. Um, so yeah, reproducibility is really documenting what you did and how you did it. Whereas a platform or a toolkit is really code that is hopefully useful to someone besides yourself. And it's really about trying to reduce the need to recode the same solution over and over again. The rest of my talk, I'm gonna be focusing on toolkits, um, but just keep in mind, you know, there's other repositories out there for other purposes. All right, so what are some key considerations when you're looking at open sourcing software for a medical purpose? Um, I think the first thing you really need to think about is what is your end goal? So I already mentioned a couple of different projects and I think each of them have unique goals. So the first is, are you making a research tool really for other researchers? If that is your goal, the main thing you wanna think about is how to make it so your code is flexible and easy to extend. Um, you also need to think about how to make your interfaces uh, open, well-documented, which I know everyone struggles with because no one wants to write documentation. Um, and while it's not true for every library, oftentimes you can ignore front ends, um, but you need to keep in mind that, you know, when you're making a research tool like Torch.io or something where you're really focusing on coding and allowing people to extend it, your ability to actually reach into the clinic is gonna be limited because there's a lot of things you won't necessarily focus on if you're just making a tool that you want other researchers to use, which brings us to the research tool for clinicians. So if you actually wanna put your software into the hands of clinicians, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about user inter uh, interactions and interfaces. That is, I will be honest with you, from my perspective as a medical image researcher, oftentimes very boring work, maybe other people who are like more into human interactions would really like it. Um, but you know, you really need to think about how to make your graphical user interface clear and easy to access, how to make it so that there's documentation associated with that that is accessible to the end user. Um, and sometimes you also need support staff to assist in running it or maybe training the clinicians. So there's a lot more overhead there. Um, the other things you really need to think about is how is your tool actually gonna integrate into the clinical workflow? Um, so especially with my experience from EpiMap, it's all well and great to say, great, you have this amazing planning software, but it doesn't actually make it into the operating room to guide the clinicians. They aren't going to use it. So how does, what other tools are they using and how does your software interface with it is very important. 
We also have to keep in mind a lot of the tools they use in the clinic are closed source. So how are you going to access that? How are you going to figure out how to either pull data off of paths or push data onto systems? Um, the other thing you have to think about is how are you going to collect feedback from the end user? Because the end user isn't going to be able to modify your system. How do you make sure that when there's a bug or an issue, if it's reported back to you and you actually address it? Um, and the final thing uh, that I think both talks previously have talked a lot about is what are the ethics of the regulatory considerations? How do you actually use it ethically on patients? You do it as part of a research study. If you're doing it as a more long-term project, how are you going to get that regulatory approval so that clinicians can actually use it on patients? Um, and I think sort of the final thing, which is really the most restricted, is you know thinking about. Uh, yes. Uh, we see you again, Miguel. Thank you. Sorry, but I'm trying to read. It's also like 3 a.m. in the morning for Stephen, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Like six, six hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're you're a trooper. That's <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I mean, so from my sense, assuming you can have a very clear idea of what you want to commercialize, you can show benefit to patient. Oftentimes, this is the quickest way to getting real clinical impacts. Um. But you also have to be aware, of, you know, if you're making an effort on the front end, which, you know, at least from my experience, there's a bit of a catch-22, right? So if you want to give a uh, planning software to clinicians, you have to spend a lot of time on the user interface to make sure the tool works well and they can use it. If you want to then sell it off to a company, the company almost always is going to have their own UI. So if your plan is licensing and commercialization, you have to be aware that it's like, okay, the key bits of the algorithms will probably get licensed. A lot of your other efforts into making a sustainable and usable platform are likely going to go to waste. Um, so, you know, and then the other thing you really need to think about is what is the lifespan of your project and how are you going to maintain support over it? So maybe if it's licensing and commercialization, you know, it's a five-year grant and then you're done and then you can, you know, I won't say abandon your code, but you don't have to worry about it. If you're going to be Know, trying to do something like Slice or Moni, which is a decades-long process, how are you going to make sure that there's support for it? It doesn't get abandoned. So the other consideration um, really is about end users, but end users more specifically, which is thinking about what their technical competency is. So even if you're looking at students or researchers, you have to think about things like, well, first of all, do you even need a UI? Right? Can you just have a command line interface? That's how a lot of us program in code. Um, what programming languages will they be familiar with? You know, so a decade ago, it's mostly C++. Nowadays, it's mostly Python. How do you support either transitioning into different programming languages or using a programming language that's accessible, right? If you, I mean, I can't think of off of the top of my head, but there's pro tons of programming languages out there that people in our community don't use. So you really need to think about that as well. Um, and then also barriers in terms of access to computational resources. So if you're a deep learning system, how are you gonna make sure that you can access GPU servers? 
Um, what about specific hardware or OSs? This has gotten a lot easier now with tools like Docker, um, but it's still something you need to think about, like what is your end user actually going to be using? Um, and finally, um, which I think is, you know, a theme of this is there's a lot of other platforms and open source solutions out there. So what other tools should you be compatible with or do you want to be compatible with? Because that's going to drive a lot of your decisions. Um, and hopefully you're thinking about compatibility so you don't have to like, you know, redo DICOM formats or image loading. For clinicians, it's a completely other scope or idea about what you want to consider. Um, so the first thing is what is a computer literacy? Um, and honestly, it's hard to make a general rule because it really depends on you know, the specialty you're dealing with and also the age of the people. Um, I deal primarily with neurosurgeons. The question of can they use command line interfaces is yes, some of them can. Some of them are actually amazing coders. A lot of them also can't. A lot of them, you show them a binary executable and you have to tell them, you know, click on it and follow the instructions. So really be aware that usually it's not a single answer, it's a spectrum. Um, and the other thing you have to think about is what sort of specialties are you developing for? And do they have other computer software they're familiar with or other systems that they use? Because this will tell you things like, you know, do you want your mouse or keyboard to mimic packs? So a lot of people who are used to looking at radiologic images already have a sense of like what the writing left button and scroll button should do. And if you don't mimic that, they're going to get frustrated very easily. Um, the other thing you have to think about is like, you know, very small things. Um, so because I deal a lot with neurosurgeons, but I, the one I'm most familiar with is radiologic versus neurologic convention. So some people are used to seeing the patient left on the left side of the screen, and some people are used to seeing patient right on the left end of the screen. So even something as simple as how you flip your image or how you display it can be dependent on which type of clinicians you're dealing with. Um, so, you know, you really have to think very carefully about who you're using it, you know, who you're designing for, and what are their expectations in terms of what your software is going to look and feel like. Um, and the final thing to think about is how busy are they in their day-to-day -day lives, right? Are they going to be able to sit and spend an hour using their software? Or are they very busy? And the whole point is they want to be able to you know, open up their software, do something for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, save it, and go about their day. Um, and that also is especially true for things like troubleshooting. Um, so at least in my experience, even the best image platforms have bugs and issues. And that's often the barrier, right? The first time it crashes or the first time you click a button and it doesn't do what you want, well, they don't have an hour to figure out what's going on. So they'll close the software and then they'll go back to the commercial system. So you really have to think very carefully about how to support it. Um, yeah, so researchers and students have a much higher tolerance for errors and unexpected behaviors. So if you want to actually do something that gets into the hands of clinicians, you have to come up with a testing strategy to make sure they aren't going to have to encounter these problems. All right, and then the third, which is my big one, is sustainability, because I think this is the biggest challenge for all of us. So the first thing is, who is actually going to be developing your software? You know, is it going to be PhD students? Is it going to be postdocs? Are you going to hire professional developers? How do you pay for that? How do you pay competitive salaries? You know, Especially in the era of deep learning, people will make you know double, if not triple, their salary if they go into industry. So how are you going to attract high-end candidates who can you know, code? Are you going to need training? Maybe not training on Python or C++, but like you know, how complicated is your backend? Do they need to learn the system specifically? Um, you know, the other thing that I'll talk a lot about, but I. I think this is very important, is what is their job? So most PhD and postdocs, their job is not to write good code, it's to publish, it's to do research. How do you support both making sure the software is stable and well-developed while also allowing people to publish? Um, and also you have to think about things like career progression and average employment, right? So most postdocs are going to be with you for a couple of years. Um, PhD students, it's a little bit variable. In the UK, they're here for three, maybe four years, and then they go. In the US, you know, we get them for maybe a little bit longer, but uh, that depends. But, you know, really what we're talking about is, especially for long-term projects, if you think the average 
you know, the average postdoc stays with you for three years. You have a 10 year project. That's three turnovers. How do you maintain that? Um, yeah, team, team continuity is also a big one. Um, so because of this term, because people are constantly leaving and going, how do you make sure people understand the background of what decisions were made? You know, especially sometimes decisions that seem stupid when you look at them in hindsight, but maybe five years ago, they were an amazing decision. Um, and also how to achieve a, a culture of good coding practices, right? How do you make sure people use the repository in the right way and use the stable master while having many development branches? The development branches make it back into master. Um, you know, things like also documentation, making sure people are writing what their code is doing, how do you track bugs? Um, and I think most importantly, who does the thankless work? And every development system I've ever worked with, there's a ton of work that needs to get done that oftentimes, you know, it's not going to end up in a research paper and it's quite boring, right? So what happens when, at least in our case, we're based on MITK, what happens when MITK releases a new release and you have to do an upgrade? That like months of work that doesn't actually do anything. Oftentimes, the only thing it does is break break the the, the code, and then the clinicians complain about it. You know, what about maintaining uh, CI runners, assuming you have them, which is good practice, right? Um, what about how to deal with push requests um, from people maybe outside of the core development team, ensuring standards are met? Um, you know, you really have to think about this because I can tell you right now, a PhD student. If you leave it up to them, they're not going to do that, right? Um, the other thing to think about, um, which I've already alluded to a little bit, is how are you going to fund the team, right? All of these positions cost money. Most funding agencies want goals related to research, not necessarily development. Now, there are a couple of grants that are development grants, um, both in the UK and in the US, so you can deal with those. But oftentimes, those development grants, their end goal is commercialization. So what, how do you get money if your end goal is we want to maintain a platform that we've already built? Um, and it's not just for developers. How do you, you know, pay for systems to allow for continuous integration, all of this sort of, you know, computers and GPUs that you might need to do nightly runners and ensure everything is kept up to date? You know, what about hosting for documentation, your repository, your bug tracker, where you put your binaries. Now, there are free solutions for this. Um, so not all these are necessary, but it can be really helpful to help maintain a presence if you have you know, some way of hosting this online in a, one central place. Um, and then the final thing to think about is if you're doing it in an open source environment, how do you maintain and support community events? So these are things like developer meetings, user meetings, hackathons, project weeks. They have a lot of different names, but you know, typically for these big groups, it's great to have everyone come for a week and just spend a week, you know, essentially contributing to the platform, shifting ideas, sharing, um, especially for multi-institutional work, bringing people together to sit down and think about the tricky issues is super important. Um, but you know, are you going to assume everyone has their own grants? They they all fly into the same place. You all pay for it, or are you going to try and find some money to help support some of these things? All right. So the final thing I want to leave you with is: Do you actually need your own engine platform? So as I've heard a couple, there's tons. There's tons for all sorts of different purposes, right? So there's robotics ones. There's ones for toolkits, specifically for annotations. You've already heard about 3D Slicer. So there's tons of already present open source solutions. Um, so you don't necessarily need to start from scratch. And I would and highly encourage you, if you're thinking about like, I want to start a software platform, first think about what all is out there and what ecosystems you can already plug in with. And if you say, yes, I do, there's nothing out there. The other, next thing you have to think about is what is your unique selling point? What is your platform doing? that the existing platforms out there don't already do. Um, what unmet need is there in the community? I .e., will you have users? Uh, how are you going to maintain it? Uh, and what is the financial development burden you're taking on 
with that maintenance, right? So there's been a ton of projects and platforms I've seen that get started. They have an initial grant. They do great. People start developing them. And then you can't get follow-up funding. How do you maintain it after that? People leave. They go away. The project dies. And the final thing I want to leave you guys on is if you decide to go with an existing platform, be a good community member. So report bugs or fix the bugs yourself. Engage with the community. Um, okay, so open, open challenges. Um, I think the first big one really is how to balance research and coding. Um, you know. So ultimately, software tends to be supported by research grants. Research grants have research goals. Um, you can take one of two approaches. So you can silo developers and researchers. So you can say, my PhD students and my postdocs are just going to do research and publish. And I'm going to have one or two software developers that maintain the platform and do all the things this work. Um, and the advantage to this is oftentimes, especially PhD students, but also postdocs don't necessarily have the best coding skills. So you don't have to do as much training. Um, the problem really is that the software developer career can really stall in academia if all you're doing is doing this sort of thankless maintenance work because you aren't going to get those first software papers you need to stay in academia. So there are some like, you know, long-term sort of software developer roles, but they often pay much poorer compared to industry. And so once you develop good coding skills, you can go off in the industry and make a lot more money. Um, the one other advantage for this is it guarantees that your research doesn't get postponed for bug fixes and your bug fixes don't get postponed for research uh, because people have very solid roles. Um, or you can mix developer research roles. Um, the thing here is you really need hands-on training almost always to get people up to speed on the platform. Um, it can lead to slower development times and, it would be, and it's easier for thankless tests to get postponed because it's not one person's job and because they're trying to balance both research and publishing with doing these sort of quick and more boring tasks. Um, but the thing I really like about this is it ensures your research is really fit for purpose and will get incorporated into the software. It's very easy when you have silos roles for someone to spend a ton of time making, making code for to write a really nice paper. And then when the de developer gets their hands on it, you realize it takes 10 hours to run and there's no way to make it faster. And then that project gets abandoned. So that won't happen in this one. Um, but I mean, really, I've seen both approaches. And it's really, I think, a bit of a management style. The other thing that uh, we've already heard about is what about regulatory approvals? So I think this is the biggest one for medical purpose. How do you deal with regulation? Um, especially if your end users are clinicians, how are you going to make sure you're using it ethically? Um, and basically, I don't know is the answer because essentially what it requires is you need some sort of quality management system in place. These are almost always well-defined systems that require tracking, bug fixing, et cetera. You need people in those roles. You need people in those roles who are very competent and good. And it's very hard to do that and also be able to incorporate you know, bug fixes from people outside of the community and make sure that they're up to par. Um, yeah. So, you know, typically within a QMS system, you have things like approval for code changes, where it's one person who's approving the code fixes. Um, you have to make sure you have really high test coverage and very, well, and very good documentation. And it's very hard to do this if most of your development is coming from an open source community. Um, I'm sure people with more experience probably have some other ideas for this. But from my personal opinion, it's just very hard to do um, and do well and do well enough that the FDA or the MHRA thinks you're doing it well. It's the other key thing. Um, yeah, and then I think the final, final thing, uh, which I think is still an issue, but I think there's great ways of addressing it is what about licensing and commercialization? So how do you support open source research? while ensuring what you're doing actually makes it to the patients, because at the end of the day, we're all in the medical research community because we want to improve patient care. Um, and you guys have already, you know, I've already talked about it. Essentially to make it into the clinic, you almost always need a commercial partner. I mean, you can do first in man, you can do 
short prospective studies at a single center, even multi-center trials are really hard to support as a researcher. Um, and commercial entities want to make money. So what do you do? So QT and others have addressed this issue by essentially having both free and commercial versions. So you have the free version with limit some limited functionality, and then you have a commercial version with maybe some features. You could do something similar, I think, in medical imaging, right, where you have a sort of free, free version where you can see and sort of plug and play with the features, and then a much more polished version that you pay, um, assuming the code base is an appropriate license, which I think these days most open source softwares are aware that this is an issue, but it's still something you need to check. So usually if you're looking at something like Spice or Moon Eye, the medical imaging ones are very good at this. A lot of the sort of computer science-based platforms <coughs> you have to be careful of. Um, the other thing you can do is you can create small spin-off companies where you use your know-how of the platform um, and essentially create a commercial product that's completely independent. Um, or you can do what I've done, which is essentially protect your IP by withholding some of your code and hoping to work with a commercial partner. But like I said, I don't think any of these is a one, like it's not a one size fits all, right? You really have to think about like what your end goal is, what your product is, or which, if you're doing the, the you know, the, the licensing route, who your commercial partner is and are they actually gonna be interested in it? Because I can tell you right now, you can't just come to a company and say like, oh, we have a great idea. We've shown it on some retrospective data. They really wanna see like, is there a market base where people pay for it? Does it impact patient care? All right, so just to sum up, in my opinion, the best thing to do is really first think about your project goal and who, who you're serving and why. Understand the ecosystem you're entering, whether that's the clinical ecosystem or the already existing open source ecosystem. Because I think the easiest way for projects to fail you put a lot of time and effort into it, and then your end users are actually interested in it. Um, so yeah. And then finally, at least for maybe not for everyone, but at least for the people who are wanting to do long-term maintenance, how are you going to pay for it? What are the research or funding uh, opportunities available to make sure you can actually hire and support staff? and support staff at the level your project is going to need. Um, because that an easy way for projects to die is anyone that knows the platform gets a higher paying job somewhere else and, and runs off and then you, you as an academic are left with a very nice code base, but no one to, uh, to you know, maintain it. All right.